The Pentagon has released more photos and information on that suspected Chinese spy balloon, which hovered over the U.S. for days. This video appears to show remains recovered by the Navy after an Air Force fighter jet shot down the balloon. Officials say it was 200 feet tall, and the White House says surveillance balloons also entered U.S. airspace at least three times during the Trump administration, but they were not detected at the time. I want to bring in General H.R. McMaster to give us his analysis on this. He's a CBS News foreign policy and national security contributor. He's the author of Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. And he also, of course, served as President, former President Trump's national security advisor. Thanks so much for joining us, General McMaster. What type of information might have been gathered by this balloon? What might they have seen? Well, good to be with you, Seth. Good to be with you, Emery. I'm sure that they were trying to gather a wide range of uh, of in intelligence, including you know, just surveillance. You know, when you're at a lower altitude, you can see things more more clearly and, and differently. They might have been measuring the atmosphere as well. You know, to to really provide data that could be used, for example, for a ballistic missile attack. I mean, I think it's important context to note that China is engaged in a massive buildup of its of its nuclear and, and missile arsenals, but it could also be collecting communications intelligence, signals intelligence, to see what means of communication we might be using around sensitive locations. So I think that's what they'll all be exploiting, Seth, is to take a look at what hardware was this balloon carrying, what kind of data were they trying to get? Uh, and I think that that could tell us a lot about you know, this portion of their really massive campaign of, uh, of espionage uh, against the United States, which takes the form of a balloon, I guess, uh, but also it appears in many other forms, including uh, cyber-enabled uh, espionage. Well, that's one, if you don't mind, yeah. one of my questions, what could the balloon have seen? We know there are satellites. Right. We know there are other ways of monitoring what's happening here. What, why a balloon? It seems low-tech, right? Yeah. <laughs> it is low tech, and I think that's one of the reasons why it went it went undetected. You know, I think you know you have to, as we've seen actually the war in Ukraine as well, right? You see old tech combined with new tech, and mm. and and I and I think that you know this this balloon to, would see things from a, a different perspective than a low Earth orbit satellite, for example. So. You know, I, I think that's what the exploitation will tell intelligence officials. We'll probably never hear about it, or won't hear about it for maybe a, a couple of decades. Uh, but but you know I, I think that they'll be able to figure out what the Chinese were trying, what questions they were trying to answer, and and that might be valuable in and of itself. So you know, as as Seth pointed out, this has happened before. It happened under the, under the Trump administration. Now we know. Um, I wonder what is a bigger problem or a bigger concern: the fact that this balloon was there, considering that it's happened before, or the fact that we all saw it and now it's created this sort of diplomatic fallout where the secretary of state had to cancel the trip and you know and now it's going to have to be addressed well i, I think it's fine that the, the secretary canceled the trip i mean I, I think what's happened recently is is the uh the chinese communist party leadership has been on you know a charm offensive you know charm mm. is a pretty low bar for them though you know and but what they've been trying to do is recover from you know the, all these self-inflicted wounds of of the zero COVID policy, the crackdown on the tech sector, the degree to which their aggression, you know, from the South China Sea to the Himalayan frontier with India uh, to, to Taiwan has really, has the world awake to the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. You know, we're talking about the incursion of this of this one balloon, but you know, just last year, Anne-Marie, there were 1,727 incursions by Chinese aircraft of Taiwan's air defense identification zone. And they've been engaged in similar uh, intimidation and activity uh, against Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, other other countries as, as well. And, and of course, you know, they're, they're building these islands and weaponizing them in the South China Sea. So I think the world's kind of awake to the nature of the Chinese Communist Party and, the, and how its aggression is placing our vital interests at risk. And so what's happening is, you know, investments drying up. People are trying to get the heck out of China, recognizing that these supply chains that are overly reliant on single points of failure there are, are an unacceptable risk. Yeah. So I hope that trend continues. I mean, don't fool, don't let them fool us again, you know, in terms of uh, acting as if they're conciliatory in any way or they want a, a better relationship. I mean, the only reason they want a better relationship is they want us to slip back into complacency. General, when we when I was based in China and we went out with some Filipino fishermen on little boats to see them building those islands in the South China Sea, and the Filipinos explained how 
frightened they were of, of this buildup. Now, of course, you've seen uh, new boosted relationships, military relationships uh, in the Philippines. What do you make of, of, of the U.S.'s posture uh, in Asia? Yeah. Well, I think it's really been positive. I, I think the it's the Biden administration should get a lot of credit for, you know, for strengthening those relationships. It actually occurred under the Trump administration too. Yeah, I think our relationship with Japan uh, under the Trump administration was as close as ever. It's even get, gotten better. You have some of these new formats, you know, like like AUKUS, which is Australia, the the, the UK, and the US, and the Quad format, you know, which includes India. Uh, Japan, Australia, and, and the U.S. But, you know, the countries in the region recognize that, that, that their sovereignty is at risk. You know, the Philippines are right to be concerned. And when we when we gave up those bases in the Philippines and no longer moved to them routinely, hey, when you don't have an address to go to uh, it, it, or in the South China Sea, it really gave the, the Chinese an opportunity to try to affect this, this land grab. I mean, they're trying to control the ocean, or at least a portion of the ocean, through, one thir- through which one third of the world's surface trade flows and not only that you know what they're doing Seth, is that they are just you know, you know with the the fishing nets that they use and everything they're just stripping the ocean uh, yeah. and oh, and uh, and creating all kinds of ecological damage you know I, i'd like to see a greenpeace flotilla or or, or two oriented on on uh, chinese uh, chi- what china calls it, its maritime militia uh, in the south china sea I'm curious about uh, your take, and maybe even yours too, Seth, on the fact that, you know, once this balloon was identified, China responded, sort of took ownership, said it was, you know, a civilian uh, balloon, Uh, not that it was there for surveillance, but they they very quickly sort of acknowledged that it was theirs. I'm wondering what you think that means. And also, you know, the Secretary of State's trip, the idea that I was, what what I understood it to be, was, you know, an attempt to sort of take the temperature down a little bit. And now that it's not happening, is there a concern that it's a missed opportunity? Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, I, I really don't think it's a missed opportunity. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you, I've been, I've been in a lot of meetings with Chinese diplomats, and, you know, they're really good at doing is reading off of cards that are pre-approved. So, I mean, I, I don't think there was going to be, it'd be a big diplomatic breakthrough. What is is concerning, though, I think, Anne-Marie, is that that we don't really have good communications with them, crisis communications. Mm -hmm. And I think it is concerning that as, you know, these tensions increase, what if the People's Liberation Army begins to to, believe their own propaganda? Uh, as as apparently the one pilot did in in 2001 with the Hainan Island incident, when a when a Japanese uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry a Chinese uh, fighter uh, rammed a American P3 aircraft, and you know that crew was held for uh, 24 uh, uh, crew members were held for you know for 10 days and so forth. So you know there there are, is a potential for a flashpoint, but I wouldn't be too concerned about about the delay of of this uh, of this diplomacy because. You know, I, I really don't think the Chinese are interested. In it. If you if you look at what the Chinese national media is saying, or if you look at what they're putting out on social media, you know they're they're bringing up a lot of these same tropes of of false claims of U.S. bio labs in Ukraine and so forth. So, I mean, if they were really interested in a better relationship, maybe they should knock that off. Hmm. All right, General H. R. McMaster, it's always great seeing you. Love the tie, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. Great to see you, Marie. Great to see you, Seth. Nice to see you. Thanks. 